savior. What else? A role model. He's love. He's forgiveness. He's what's life. He is life. He's the way, the truth, the life. Jesus, he died for every man's sin. What else? He rose from the dead. He's living on the right hand of the guy today. See you later. Who is Jesus Christ? He's a guy, long hair, and very religious. Does he mean anything to you? Nothing. Who do you think Jesus is? Uh, you know, depends on who you ask. Character in a book, real life person. I'm asking you, what do you think? I'm not sure. You ever thought about it? Yeah, I think about it all the time. I still don't have an answer yet, though. Who is Jesus Christ? You know, I have no idea. You never thought about it? Yeah, I have thought about it. My opinions uh, vary from day to day. Who it might be. I'm either a true man or the true son of God. He claimed he was the son of God. And he could give you a reason to get up every day. Would you disagree with it? I don't know. I'd have to see him say it. you think there's a reason to decide who he was or to have an opinion on him, or do you think it's just kind of just mental acrobatics? I guess mental acrobatics. That's a good way to put it. I hadn't thought of it in that term. So it doesn't really matter either way what you think. There's no well, consequence for it. Opinion that, you know, I hold true, but... Does it matter to you what my opinions are? Not real life. Should it? Not real life. So. What does it matter to you? I don't know. I haven't answered that question. Still checking it out. Yeah, kind of surveying the land, seeing how things fall. Living in a culture that does not know who Jesus is. And it's my desire that every member of this church knows who he is and that we are spreading the word. Welcome to Jesus Is, a journey through John's gospel. Today we go into John chapter 3, and to read our text, I'm going to show an excerpt from the Gospel of John movie, which stars Henry Ian Cusick and is narrated by Christopher Plummer. It's very well done. It's three hours long, and it is the Good News Bible, word for word, put to film. If you've never seen it, I highly recommend it. John chapter 2, verse 23 is where we're beginning, and we'll continue into verse 21 of John 3. While Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, many believed in him as they saw the miracles he performed. But Jesus did not trust himself to them because he knew them all. There was no need for anyone to tell him about them, because he himself knew what was in their hearts. There was a Jewish leader named Nicodemus, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. One night, he went to Jesus. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher sent by God. No one could perform the miracles you are doing unless God were with him. I am telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can a grown man be born again? He certainly cannot enter his mother's womb and be born a second time. I am telling you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. A person is born physically of human parents, but is born spiritually of the Spirit. Do not be surprised, because I tell you that you must all be born again. The wind blows wherever it wishes. You hear the sound it makes, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. It is like that with everyone who was born of the Spirit. How can this be? You are a great teacher in Israel. And you don't know this. I am telling you the truth. We speak of what we know and report what we have seen. 
Yet none of you is willing to accept our message. You do not believe me when I tell you about the things of this world. How will you ever believe me then when I tell you about the things of heaven? And no one has ever gone up to heaven except the Son of Man who came down from heaven. As Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the desert, in the same way the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to be its judge, but to be its savior. Those who believe in the Son are not judged. But those who do not believe have already been judged because they have not believed in God's only Son. This is how the judgment works. The light has come into the world, a people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds are evil. Those who do evil things hate the light and will not come to the light because they do not want their evil deed to be shown up. But those who do what is true come to the light in order that the light may show that what they did was in obedience to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask you to speak to us today. Make these few verses come alive to our hearts. May we never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 2, Jesus goes on to the 19-acre campus of the temple and cleans house, cleanses the temple. Uh, he officially goes public. He had already turned water into wine, went public over in Galilee, but he went into the capital and cleaned house. There were corruption. They were making money hand over fist. Some historians think they were making up to 300 grand a year off of those coming to Passover by the corrupt deeds they were doing, uh, forcing people to change money and adding an exorbitant exchange rate as well as condemning their sacrifices, forcing them to buy local sacrifices at exorbitant rates. And so Jesus cleaned house. And while he was there, he did the miracles in Jerusalem. And so in wake of those two things, Nicodemus comes to him. And today we're going to look at this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The name Nicodemus means conqueror of people or victor of people. He was a leader. He was named a leader, and he was a leader of the Pharisees. It's believed he was a member of the Sanhedrin. At the time, there were 6,000 Pharisees in Israel. Pharisees were laymen. They were not priests or Levites, but they were legalists. They were separatists, but not isolationists. They believed in living in the culture, and they added to the law of Moses to show how spiritual they were. They went beyond what the law required and also demanded it of others. They were mean, and they were often in con conflict with Jesus. At the time, there was around 40,000 rabbis, of whom were 22,000 Levites and priests. And overseeing all of this was the Sanhedrin Council, which was 70 of the most brilliant men in the land of Judea and Israel. And Nicodemus was one of them. And he came to see Jesus at night. Perhaps it was because he wanted some time alone with him to talk about deep theology because as a member of the Sanhedrin, as a Pharisee, he would pretty much have the law of Moses memorized as well as good portions of the Talmud. Also, though, he may have come at Jesus by night because he would face persecution should he have a lengthy conversation with him in public. He did, I believe, became a believer. He stood up for Jesus. Later on in the book of John, we'll see this. And then when it came time to bury Jesus at his crucifixion, he, along with Joseph of Arimathea, gave Jesus a decent burial. And so this conversation is very crucial in the life of this man, and I believe in our lives as well, if we'll take heed to what is shared. He said to Jesus, Rabbi or teacher, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Now notice he said we. As a member of the Sanhedrin, he had their attention. 
He interrupted their corrupt business dealings. They knew he was right. And they knew these miracles that he performed. And we know what kind of miracles they were because we've read about them throughout the Gospels, healing people and changing people's lives and feeding hungry folks. So they knew he was from God. But as time went along, their corruption took over and their fear of God was overruled by their selfishness. So at this point, they all were shook up by who Jesus was, the first part of his ministry. And so he comes to him, one of their leaders, and says, we know you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them, which is proof that these things were amazingly unimitatable. They were not fake. They were real miracles. Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, most assuredly, he's underlining what he's about to say, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now here this guy is, an expert in the law. He thinks he knows everything there is to know about the kingdom of God. And Jesus humbles him and says, most assuredly, you've got to be born again. Now, the term born again is not foreign to Nicodemus because the Talmud said that for a Gentile to become a proselyte, he must become as a newborn babe. A proselyte is a Gentile converting to Judaism. The man would have to get circumcised. The women would have to change their kitchens to kosher, and they would have to become very teachable if they were going to truly become Jews. And the Talmud said they must become as newborn babes. And here Nicodemus comes to Jesus, this leader of the people, this expert of the law, and Jesus tells him, you got to become as a newborn. you got to be born again. Some translations say born from above. So let's, let's, just, let's just say right. They're both right. Born again from above. you got to have a change, Nicodemus. You can't even see the kingdom of God. I don't care what kind of degrees you have. You must be born again. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said in two other places, Mark 10, 15, Luke 18, 17, Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. We must become as newborn babes. 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us we have been begotten again to a living hope. 1 Peter 2.2 2 tells us as newborn babes, we are to desire the pure milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Now, I believe being born again is a spiritual experience, but if you reduce it down to just having some kind of experience where you get some kind of emotional buzz and you go on about your life without being teachable as a child, you've not truly been born Nicodemus says to him, verse 4, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's playing dumb. He knows what Jesus is saying. And he knows Jesus isn't saying, Hey, get back in your mama. I mean, that's crazy. He's probably bigger than his mom. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And he already told him, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you've been born again. And here he tells him, you can't enter the kingdom of God unless you've been born of water in the spirit. Now there's four interpretations of this verse, verse five of John three. What is this being born of water and the spirit? I'm going to tell you what four of them are and then you can make your mind up. Because what we think really doesn't matter, right? So it's not going to be a test for fellowship. To some people, Being born of water is water baptism. And being born of the Spirit is either being born again or to others being baptized in the Holy Spirit. To other people, being born of water is being born of the Word. There's a verse in the Bible that says, we are cleansed by the washing of water by the Word. Kenneth Hagin taught this. We are born again of the Word and the Spirit. That's good. If it's true, why didn't Jesus just say word? I'm not throwing rocks at it, but it could be very well be true. John Calvin taught, and other people believe, like John MacArthur, that being born of water in the Spirit is the Spirit doing cleansing 
and the Spirit bringing new life. And Nicodemus needed to be cleaned up. He was full of religious pride. He needed the cleansing of the Spirit. And he needed the infilling of the Spirit. And a fourth interpretation is based on the next verse. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And that interpretation is being born of water is your normal birth, your natural birth. What sign a baby's about to come into the world? The what breaks? The water breaks. So unless one is born naturally and spiritually, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That makes sense, but why would he be telling Nicodemus to be born of of water? He already had been. So there's just kind of an element of mystery in this. I think basically he told the guy he needed to be cleaned up and he needed new life. And how that's played out, obviously, if we're, if we're going to be cleaned up by the Spirit, we're going to obey the Lord's commands. And the first thing he tells a believer to do is to be baptized. So we are going to be baptized. And it's all in obedience to his word, right? So I just think... If we're going to enter the kingdom of God, we should want it all. To be born again, to be born from above, to be filled with the Spirit, to be baptized in water, to be immersed in the Word, to be cleaned by the work of the Spirit and empowered by the power of the Spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you, he pointed to this high-powered man with a very respected position, Jesus is not trying to win friends and influence people here, is he? He's not giving him a Holy Ghost pep talk. He's telling him the truth. Dude, you ain't got it going on. You're not in the kingdom. You want to talk theology with me? Be born again first. Become as a child. Humble yourself. You must be born again. Most assuredly was his opening statement. So he came to him wanting to talk theology. We know you're a teacher, come from God, for no one can do these things that you have done unless God is with you. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Oh, do I have to get inside my mommy again? Jesus didn't even mess with that one. Unless you're born of water and the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God. Don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. How does Nicodemus take this? We'll find out a little later in the transforming of his life. Now, let's look at this interesting verse. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it. They cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You notice in the video we watched, the filmmakers chose to have them move outside and the conversation continue outside while the wind is blowing. Who has been watching the Bible and the History Channel? I understand that when they filmed this part of the story of Jesus, uh, they were having a conversation somewhere outside that a strange wind just came and began to blow on them while Jesus was telling them this. The blowing of the Spirit. So I've heard this taught. The Holy Spirit's like the wind. He is. He's unpredictable. You can hear the results of Him through changed lives, change the way we speak by the work of the Spirit, but you don't know where He is or where He's going or where He comes from. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. That's fine, but let's dig a little deeper. The word wind that Jesus used is recorded by John in chapter 3, verse 8, is the same word Jesus used for spirit. Over 300 times, that word is in the New Testament. And only in this place is it translated wind. And here in the same verse... The translators chose to translate it as wind. It's the word pneuma. You've heard of pneumonia or pneumatic. It has to do with air, breathing, inspiration. Here, for some reason, the King James guys got us off track, perhaps, chose to translate that as wind, but the second one is spirit. So you could say the wind blows where it wishes, so is everyone born of the wind. 
So what I think may be a more accurate translation, you can hold to the wind translation, it's fine, but I think what will open your eyes up to how we're born again is by translating the word pneuma as spirit. The spirit blows where he wishes, and you hear the sound. The word there for sound is the word phone, it's where we get the word telephone, voice. The Holy Spirit breathes where he wishes, and you hear his voice. They cannot tell where he comes from or where he goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And I thought, discovering this while I'm studying, I thought, I wonder if any other translations bear this out. Sure enough, I found the literal translation version, which records it as this. The Spirit breathes where he desires, and you hear his voice, but you do not know from where he comes and where he goes. So is everyone having been generated from the Spirit. How are we born again? By grace are we saved through faith, and that faith is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. So we are saved when we receive saving faith. When you believe the gospel, which is impossible to believe, to the unbelieving world it looks like foolishness. You believe that a man came born of a virgin, died on a cross for the wrongdoing of the world, so that through faith in what he did, our sins can be forgiven. All those who are saved believe that is true because God gave them the ability to believe it. How does a person receive that ability to believe the gospel? They hear God speak. Romans chapter 10 says, faith comes by hearing. How does hearing come? Hearing comes by the rhema, or that is a spoken word of God. So how does hearing come? Hearing comes when God speaks. How does faith come? Faith comes when we hear God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. I've heard people try to sell tapes with that verse. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. If you buy this set of tapes, you'll have faith. You might. But if you do, it's because you're hearing God speak. So when you hear someone speak the gospel to you, and something in your heart tells you, this is the truth, that is God speaking to you given you saving faith. So the Spirit breathes where He desires. I know we've chosen the Lord, and I know we found the Lord, but in reality, none of us would have enough sense to get in out of the rain if it wasn't for the mercy of God. He's the one that opened our eyes to the choice. Don't get into debate with the Apostle Paul on that one. He believed the Lord chose him because he was on the road to kill Christians and God stopped him dead in his tracks and he made a U-turn with his life because of God's hand upon him. The Spirit breathes where he desires. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for instruction in righteousness and reproof and correction. So God breathes, the Spirit of God breathes where he desires And you hear him breathe. You hear his voice. You don't know where he comes or where he goes. He's invisible. So is everyone having been generated by the Spirit. So Nicodemus eventually heard God speak, and he was born again. But to hear God speak, you must humble yourself, become as a child, become willing to believe. God so loved the world that he gave his son for you. If you find yourself believing that, it's because you're hearing God speak to you, breaking through your natural defenses to allow you to embrace what the world calls foolishness as the wisdom of God. Are you able to see that? Well, I'm gonna, if you want to talk about it some more, we'll talk about it after service. I'm an exhorter, and I'll get on one thing and hammer it to death. And Meanwhile, you've already got it, so... All right, so let's move on. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Are you the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I want to suggest to you he knew them, but he, he had to humble himself to apply them to his situation. Because after all, he had on the prayer shawl. He had on the phylacteries. He celebrated all the feasts perfectly. He had the law memorized. He had to become as a child in order to enjoy the benefit of what he knew. 
There's a lot of people in the world that have a lot of Bible knowledge. They're not believers. Because they're unwilling to humble themselves and see the fact that they need a Savior. They need a Savior. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. This isn't the proverbial we. This is the we of the Godhead. He was God manifested in the flesh. I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Nicodemus, we can't go any deeper than this. This is Christianity 101. This is what the prophets looked for. Verse 13, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the son of man who is in heaven. Looks like omnipresence to me. Some people surmise that maybe that was added later. Okay, well, if it was added later, fine. The point is, Jesus declared that he came down from heaven. And John declares in his writing that he came down from heaven and that he went back to heaven. So he came down, he went back, and he sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is blowing through the land, speaking words of life to those who will Verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Here he's speaking of his crucifixion. In Numbers chapter 21 is a strange little story. The children of Israel sinned against the Lord, and God removed his hand of protection and allowed snakes to hit their camp. They're in the wilderness on their way to the promised land and they began to be snake bit and they were dying like flies. Tourniquets couldn't help. They had no anti-venom with them. They were dying. So they went to Moses and repented. We're so sorry. Please pray to the Lord to save us from these snake bites. And Moses prayed and the Lord said, make a serpent out of brass, put it on a pole and hold it up. And whoever looks at this serpent on a pole, will be healed of their snake bite. There's an artist's rendering of what it may have looked like. And all who looked at the serpent on the pole would be healed of snake bites. Those who said, that's silly, that's dumb, that's not going to work, and refused to look, died from the bites. But those who looked, lived. Jesus compares himself to that. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Literally what he said was, shall not perish, but shall continually have eternal life. Meaning, from looking to him in faith for what he did for us on the cross, we receive eternal life and it does not stop. When we die, it's bye-bye body and hello Jesus. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Death for us is just the ending of our earth suit's existence. Oh, we live on. That's why when a believer dies, there's not fear. There's peace. There's victory. Sadness for us that have to say bye for now, but joy for them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Just as God instructed Moses to put a serpent of brass on a pole and raise it up, so God sent his son and allowed him to be lifted up so that through looking to him in faith, we are healed from the snake bite of sin. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The good news of the gospel is good news because of the bad news. The bad news is this. We were created perfect in the image of God, but we have fallen into sin. You see it in the lives of our children. 
When they're born, they're born perfect. Perfect. But let us learn to walk and talk and we start lying and stealing and being greedy and not wanting to share. What is that? It's our fallenness showing up. We need to be saved from our sin. So through the gift of God's Son, we receive salvation. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. We're already condemned. We're already condemned. He came to save us. Romans 8, 3 says that Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. He saved people, but he condemned sin. By becoming sin for us, he was snake-bitten for us, as it were. He became sin for us and nailed it to the cross in his body so that through faith in him we can leave our sins behind. Jesus is our antidote. Can we say antidote? The word antidote is a remedy that counteracts the effects of poison. It's something that relieves or prevents. The term ultimately is derived from the Greek word antididomai, which means given against. Given against. God so loved that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him would have eternal life. He was given for us, but given against our sin. He is our antidote. He's our cure. He is our remedy. God did not send his son into the world, John 3, 17, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already. We have more lifesavers than any church in Texas. You know why they're called lifesavers? Some people call them breath savers. Here, have a mint. I mean a hint. I mean a mint. We have them because on Sunday morning, you know, with coffee, sometimes we need a little help. These are fellowship enhancers <laughs> or fellowship tolerators. They're made lifesavers for two reasons. One, they're the shape of a lifesaver that's thrown to a person's drowning. Also, theoretically, if one gets caught in your throat, you'll be able to breathe through that hole. <laughs> I'm not testing it. If a person is drowning, they're drowning, right? They need saving. Any lifeguards in the house? If a person's drowning, they need help, right? They need somebody to throw them a lifesaver or swim out there and get them. But if they refuse the lifesaver by saying they're not drowning and they drown, what have they done? They've condemned themselves. The world is drowning in sin. If you don't believe it, my God, look at the papers. Look at the Hood County News. Read the whole thing. There is problems in the human race. And be careful about looking down our noses on others. Yes, that's the way the Baptists are. Watch out. We need a Savior. <laughs> Let's say you were choking on one of these and the... <laughs> didn't work. What do you need? You need a high leg remover, right? But you keep saying, I'm good. I'm good. No, leave me alone. I'm good. <laughs> That's the condition of the world. You're offending me telling me I'm a sinner. I've never been to jail. Well, you've never been caught. Texas Monthly Magazine, last month's issue, has Lance Armstrong for like the fourth time on the cover. This time is totally different from the other times. There's his picture with a question, will he ever be redeemed? Subtitle, Inside the Fallen World of Lance Armstrong. 
the world is condemning him for his sins that were very public. Not just for taking, you know, illegal drugs to enhance his performing ability to win how many Tour de France's? Seven in a row. But for lying about it, so bold-facedly lying. So my question today, will he ever be redeemed? Not in the eyes of the world and not by himself, but through Christ. There is redemption available even for Lance Armstrong. And for you and for me. Chuck Colson died recently. Highly respected man. Totally redeemed in the eyes of the world because he was redeemed by the hand of God. He perjured himself before the U.S. Senate and wound up going to prison. Part of the Watergate scandal under the Nicholson regime. He was born again. In fact, he wrote a book called that. By the time he died, he built a powerful ministry blessing thousands of prisoners around the world. Can Lamps Armstrong be redeemed? Yes. yes. Jesus is the only way. Don't wait until... Sin has taken you that far to realize, yep, I need a Savior. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. There is our lifesaver. Jesus, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus, save me from my sin, from myself, from my unforgiveness, from my bitterness, from my unhappiness, from my destructiveness. But if we don't believe in his name, we won't call on his name. His name will just be a cuss word. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is a condemnation that the light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing Evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. The primary reason we don't want to be saved is we don't want to stop. We're having too much fun and we don't want to admit that we are wicked. We want to look down our noses at people in jail and not look in the mirror lest our deeds be exposed. And finally, but he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. He changes our deeds. He changes our want-tos. He changes our desires. He changes our behavior. The basic Bible writes it like this. He whose life is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his acts have been done by the help of God. The contemporary English version says, but everyone who lives by the truth will come to the light because they want others to know that God is really the one doing what they do. Jesus is really the one that lives a Christian life through us. By the promptings of his spirit, we realize we've done wrong, and when we do, we apologize to those we have wronged, beginning with God. And we seek to walk in peace with all men and reconcile with our enemies. And slowly, day by day, he begins to change us and mature us and grow us As newborn babes desiring the pure milk of the word, he does the work. If there's anything good in us, it's him. That bumper sticker, if you got one on your car, please take it off. Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. We are not just forgiven. We have been made the righteousness of God. And he's doing a work in our heart, taking us beyond just being forgiven. It could be interpreted by the unbelieving world that we have a license to sin. God forbid. His goodness is so good, some people think it is. But we are forgiven. But now he's taken us on from glory to glory to glory to glory. Conforming us. We have been predestined to be conformed to the image of God's Son. Romans 8 is in operation. There is an anti-venom shortage. I discovered in research in the sermon. There is a serious anti-venom shortage in the land. And in a few years, if you're snake bit, you may be in trouble. This stuff currently costs $1,600 a vial. I read the story of a man that was bitten by a timber rattlesnake. It took 30 vials. It's expensive stuff. You know how they make anti-venom? They milk a snake, get the venom out, 
And they do some things to it, but part of what they do to it is they dilute it and inject it into a sacrificial animal. Sometimes sheep. Sometimes other animals. You see where I'm going? And as the animal survives, they nurture that animal, take care of that animal, then they withdraw the blood from that animal and get the antivenom out. Christ became sin for us so that through his blood, our sins, the poison of eternal death could be redeemed. You see it? Jesus is our antidote for the condemnation of sin. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, if comparing a brass snake on a pole to Jesus Christ on the cross bothers you, let me help you. The serpent has always been the symbol of evil. If you're a snake handler, God bless you. They have churches for you. I'm teasing. I'm teasing. God bless you for your fearlessness. May you lay hands on the rest of us. But Satan appeared, manifested as a serpent in the garden and tempted us to sin. And serpents were allowed to bite the children of Israel in the wilderness for their rebellion and complaining against the Lord. And then they were redeemed from those bites by looking at this bronze serpent on a pole. What is that? Bronze or brass is symbolic of judgment. It's symbolic of condemnation. In the tabernacle of Moses and in the temple of Solomon, the altar, the place of sacrifice, the place where the animal was judged for the sins of the people was made out of what? Brass. Jesus in the book of Revelation is described as having feet of what? Brass. Under the curse of the law, Deuteronomy 28 said that if you didn't walk in the law perfectly and didn't follow all the ways of the Lord that heavens would be brass to you. So brass speaks of judgment. And so a brass serpent speaks of judgment on the serpent or judgment on sin. And so as they looked at the symbol of judgment upon their sin, they were healed of the snake bite. Jesus judged the serpent. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God told the man and woman, that he would put enmity between the woman and Satan, between her seed, singular, and his seed. And he would bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent would bruise his heel. On the cross, Jesus is bruised all over, but he's very much bruised on one heel, hanging on three nails, one foot on top of the other one, all the weight, of his body and weight of the sins of the world was on his hands, both feet, and one heel. But through that bruising, Satan lost all authority he had taken from man, unjustly so, so that through faith in Christ we gain victory over the enemy. His headship or his authority is broken through the name of Jesus. The serpent has been brassed. Are you glad about it? Let's stand. Father, I pray for every person here that does not know you. I pray, Lord, they begin to see the beauty of the gospel, that the stories would begin to make sense, that your spirit would breathe inspiration. May they begin to hear your voice, that this stuff is true, that you did come and die for our sins, that you are the antidote for the poison of human wickedness. Thank you, Lord for your goodness and your grace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. And may He reveal Himself to you in ways that He chooses, confirm into your heart that He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. And may you receive by faith through calling on his name the forgiveness of your sins 
and the gift of eternal life. Seek the new birth. Humble yourself as a child. See the need for a total new beginning in your life. And he will give it. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. We are so glad that you are our guest. We pray the Lord blesses you in every area of your life. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power. Every chain, break every chain, break every chain. To break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every